Michel, and uh, welcome everybody. It, it's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be able to discuss with you. Uh, I would love to be here with you all, but uh, it's really great to be able to have this time together to discuss dermatology. So uh, yes, I am passionate about food allergy, it's true. So I hope I will be able to share this passion with you. So I'm going to, to share my screen now so that we can uh, start uh, the uh, lecture together. So just a second, oops, here we go. And so to have this uh, session, we want to try to have it interactive. So there will be a few questions during uh, the session also. So um, uh, uh, there are some uh, questions around truth or myths. And uh, here are two, uh, two things related to movies. And we know how there are great movies from India. And um, there are some kind of misconception that we can, that can be shared through some movies, such as the one from Matrix, like shooting two guns at the same time can look cool in, in movies or uh, things with grenade that can be dramatically pulled out with one stiff in, in some movies, but is it truth? No, actually, it's just a myth. Truth is that this is just impossible. It's just for fiction. And here uh, I discuss about myths and truth because it's really key to uh, bust some myths, misconception in dermatology. And there are many ones around food allergy. And that's why your expertise is really crucial you as veterinarian who have direct contact with the pet owners and you are the one who provide the real answer, clear, precise to the question, even though sometimes the question may be tricky. So that's what we are going to try to do today to try to, to do meat busting around food allergy. So we talk about food because food in dermatology can have many benefits some on the inflammation of the skin or skin barrier, some on coat quality, coat growth. But here we will really focus on food allergy. And we will tackle this through six key topics and questions that you may already wonder about or that uh, pet owner ask you about. So the first key question, um, and Dr. Vishal already explained how uh, frequent dermatology consultations are. So you might see it already in your daily uh, practice, but the question is about real food allergy. Are they rare? Uh, are they really rare? As some, some people think, or are they most frequent that one could expect? And to answer this question, we will rely on some uh, rigorous uh, science and it's called critically appraised topics. So C80s and C80s basically are really uh, nearly in the top of this pyramid of scientific information. So it's really a good review of really relevant literature or Congress abstracts that are really uh, uh, scientifically valid. And uh, for dermatology, we uh, have really the, um, the chance as, uh, we could benefit from the expertise of top renowned dermatology uh, experts and those uh, three experts you have here, so Professor Thierry Olivry, Professor Ralph Muller, and uh, Pascal Prelo, those were the three dermatologists who built those uh, C80s in dermatology on food allergy to really help answer key questions we may have uh, from daily practice. And th this was presented in some World Congress, the one in Bordeaux in 2016, um, the one last year also, and there are really uh, quite some papers uh, around food allergy question. It is important to, to see that uh, those papers are available online on the BMC Vet Journal, and they are in open access. It was a choice we made to publish there so that everybody can see it, and it's e easy to read, quick, not uh, so, so long paper. Uh, and then we will uh, have soon uh, some information about the first question that you may want to ask uh, Dr. Vishal now before we, we have elements to help answer. Yeah. yeah, so thank you, Isabel. Can we have first poll question? So guys, the poll question will appear just below the chat box <clears throat> and you will get hardly 30 minutes, 30 seconds to answer it. 
so our first question on your screen guys can we have a poll question team so the first question is about the prevalence in case of a uh, in case of a pets particularly in case of a uh, cats and dogs so what what is the percentage you feel is uh, this particular condition is prevalent in case of a cats and dogs and the options are in front of you you just need to pick any one correct option which you feel and uh, you need to answer it so what is the percentage of pets with chronic pruritis who actually suffer from adverse food reaction and your options are below 1% around 5% and around 15 to 20% so we already got a huge response 79% of uh, our uh, participants they selected answer option 3 so now over to you isabel good thanks for answering this question um it's really crucial to, to get more data and it was not easy to find uh, real figures but those three dermatologists went uh, reading many papers and that's where they came uh, with um, those charts you have here to really uh, give the percentage of pets which have adverse food reaction and uh, which may suffer from skin disease in general or pruritus in general and that was the question we asked or amongst all the dogs that have chronic scratching around you can see here around 20% actually it's because of food allergy and it cats the, the figure is also high so you have a sum up in the table so um in pruritic disease 80% 80% of dogs it's food allergy and 60% of cats it's also food allergy so this is not uh, so rare actually it's really something we have to think of when there are pets coming and scratching for some time a second question we think is relevant to discuss is about the signs the symptoms and uh, sometimes uh, even so, so, some veterinarians can think that the, the signs are really clear and when making a good consultation and examination you can know for sure and unfortunately no we cannot know just based upon the signs because the signs can be common to some other pathology and for this uh, there was also some critically appraised topic really addressed to address these points about what are exactly the cutaneous signs and also the other signs that may be present in pets with adverse food reaction and here you have a uh, first information about the age of onset because it's also a question uh, we may uh, wonder about uh, if it's a puppy do i need to worry and to think it's maybe food allergy or not here are the data for dogs it's the age of onset of food allergy when it's were really diagnosed for sure and you can see that it appears before 1 year old in 38% of dogs so it's it's significant actually huh? so and uh, even younger it can appear before 6 month old in basically one dog out of five So just to remember this can happen also in growing animals. For cats uh, we have less uh, publication but they managed to find those data so you can see it can happen before 1 year old in 23% cases and before 6 months it's it's uh, uh, more rare. So in dogs and in cats it can happen in growing animals above all in dogs we have really to to include this in the potential differential diagnosis. Uh, this is just the uh, variable representation of males and females and uh, this will lead to our second question which is more linked to breed predisposition thank you isabel to, uh, yeah thank you isabel can we have second question on screen guys yeah so second question, second is, question about, is about is there any is clear, there any clear breed predisposition, predisposition to afr shall our here uh, yeah, there was an echo there was an echo can you just repeat the question yeah so the question, so the question is, is 
Is there any clear breed predisposition to A for A for pets? Pets. So this one is a, is a tricky question. So we can move, we can now. move now. Okay, thanks. So it's tricky because uh, uh, there were some myths around it. And uh, thanks to these reviews, now we have uh, real information. So in dogs, they really check all papers uh, with relevant information. And those are really the three main breeds that were uh, presenting food allergy in all those uh, strict papers. So Labrador Retriever, West Island One Terriers, and German Shepherds account for, uh, as you can see, um, nearly 40% nearly of cases. And what is important when we talk about breed predisposition is to think what we need to be sure we can say it's breed predisposition. You need some prevalence in that breed, but you need also to have data of the, the breed uh, presence in a country to make a good comparison with reference population. Because otherwise it can happen you have many cases on one breed, but also on the other one, this breed is overrepresented in a study or in a country. So here they check everything, and that's why they can say it's real breed predisposition for these three breeds. So I don't know if there are many uh, of those breeds in India, but those are the, the data uh, worldwide. For cats, it's different. For cats, they could find some uh, quite some breeds uh, overrepresented: domestic short hair, Persian, Siamese, and Burmese, uh, uh, less mostly domestic short hair. But when they compare to reference population, we could not say it's real breed predisposition. It's just that those are more, uh, more represented. So the answer to the question was tricky. In dogs, yes, there is clear predisposition. In cats, so far, no. Then regarding pruritus, it's interesting to see the signs. Um, and there are also differences between dogs and cats. In dogs, uh, uh, scratching is really generalized. It can happen on the face, in between uh, the fingers, on the abdomen. So most cases have pruritus a bit everywhere. What is different, and we will see uh, afterwards, is that we cats, you will see it's more uh, localized. And regarding the signs, uh, here is a sum up, um, thanks to uh, Professor Olivry, about the key skin manifestation in dogs with food allergy. As you can see, the one that is really present is otitis externa. And this is important to remember because it can happen also with environmental atopy. So the signs may be the same. But if it's otitis externa in a dog with chronic scratching, it can be both. So we have to remember it may be food allergy. Pyoderma is also very frequent in uh, food allergic dogs. And atopic dermatitis symptom uh, is also quite present. So with uh, inflamed skin, um, it can have some papules, um, hair loss because of uh, the scratching, and then, but less frequently, pyotraumatic dermatitis. For cats, as we say, it's, it's rather different. They really scratch also, but it doesn't express at the same place, nor in the same way. And you see that generalized pruritus is not frequent in cats. It's much more localized to specific areas, and that we will see now into detail. In cats with food allergy, there are four main manifestations. So the, the, this is a sum up of those four cases, and picture also courtesy of uh, Professor Olivry. And it's really typical to cats that you wouldn't see the same things in dogs. It's one uh, in one case out of two allergic cats you have lesions on head and neck, and they call it head and neck ulcerative dermatitis. So it's very frequent, as you can see, in food allergic cats. Then uh, in nearly also one cat allergic out of two, you have what they call self-induced alopecia, and we will uh, detail this afterwards. Then you have also what they call miliary dermatitis with a kind of small papules, and you have eosinophilic disease globally in 18% cases. 
So that's very different to, to dogs. And it's, it's important to have these uh, ideas in mind. And wh what is different in cats? Uh, so, some uh, dermatologists talk about secret groomers. And that's a nice way to express that sometimes you can ask pet owners, uh, do you see your cat scratching? Do you think he has really itchy skin? And they may answer no, just because they don't see uh, a cat scratching. Whereas dogs, you can see them scratching with their feet, uh, but cats are more secret. Sometimes they do it in a hidden place where uh, pet owners cannot see them. And also they don't express it mostly by uh, scratching as dog can do with their, uh, with their paws. It can express as leaking, excessive leaking, just because the skin is really itchy. So when asking the question, do you see your cat scratching or do you think it's itchy? It may be important to consider this and to explain to cat owners what we mean by, by itchy or excessive grooming in cats. And what is important also in cat and the difference as compared to dog is that their tongue, as you know, as there are these kind of spikes. Uh, and when they have excessive leaking, this will trigger uh, lesions uh, because of really uh, erosion with the tongue. And this can really lead to these self-induced alopecia uh, patterns, as you can see here. And another point, of course, is with the clothes. Uh, so here with wolverine is, of course, exaggerated, but just to, ex it explains the lesions we can see. The skin is very reactive, very inflammative, but because of the tongue, because of the clothes, cats can themselves trigger very uh, severe lesions. And here you had an example from a journal where you had a food allergic cat, a um, uh, Persian, who was uh, suffering from allergy to uh, some fish. And after, um, just after a clipping, you can see the, the, how ulcerative the skin is. So this is important in the management um, because uh, there are some questions around, should we put Elizabethan color to those cats to stop the scratching? And there was a nice paper uh, recently in vet dermatology, where they try to investigate an alternative to this Elizabethan collar that sometimes just can stand with nail caps, as you, you may see perhaps on, on this slide. So some nail caps that are rather safe and seem efficient so that the cat can still groom, which is an important behavior for cats. So it's, it's uh, not always, always advised to stop them growing. They have to groom but they don't have to trigger those lesions. So nail caps perhaps may be an alternative uh, to help decrease those lesions. We talk about head and neck excoriation, and you have some, uh, also some uh, illustrations here. And you can see on the chart on the left that it is a difference uh, as compared to uh, other pathology, uh, allergic one, such as the flea bite hypersensitivity. Flea bite hypersensitivity you can have, uh, some lesion in the face, but often less severe, and it's more at the basis of the tail. Here, with food-induced uh, hypersensitive dermatitis, really you can have some lesion on the hand and the neck. And in the, in the picture you have on the right uh, bottom, there was some question if it was like traumatic uh, lesions or something uh, like a mechanical striction, and actually it was food allergy. And the, the last one was about eosinophilic uh, issue and plagues. So you have some examples here just to show what it looks like. And one very important point they found in those reviews and also now in some dentistry congresses, they sometimes talk about it, is that you, have can, you can have lesion in the mouth, like you, you can have indolent ulcer on the lips, but also some abscesses or ulcers in the mouth that are, are linked to food allergy. And this is something new uh, that we didn't think uh, of uh, even some years ago. So just if you have a suspicion uh, with a cat of being food allergy, uh, please uh, just think of really examining the mouth very well. And then, of course, there are signs that are not linked to skin. And so in dogs, uh, it's, uh, it's mostly digestive signs. Uh, most cases with non-cutaneous signs have diarrhea, and a few ones have vomiting or increased defecation. In cats, you can also have diarrhea and vomiting in some cases, uh, but you can also have some uh, other um, uh, more bizarre signs. Uh, so just for information to, to remember, conjunctivitis, 
can be a sign of food allergy, uh, excessive salivation, and there were a few cases also with respiratory signs, a bit like asthma. Uh, so really some key points to, to, to think about uh, clinical signs and agile onset. 40% uh, of dogs develop signs by one year old, and it seems to develop a bit later in cats. Uh, German Shepherds, Labrador Retriever, and Westie account for 40% of the cases. And in nearly all food allergic pets, you will have pruritus. So it's really an important sign. If you have chronic pruritus, it may be food allergy and you have to investigate. And just remembering that in cats, there are really four specific signs. And we can also think of it when there is diarrhea, vomiting, increased defecation, or some uh, conjunctivitis or salivate in, in cats. So now we, we move to another point, which is very important, is how to diagnose it. And uh, I made here the myth around blood tests, but it's really uh, an important question. So I don't know how, how you manage it in, uh, in your daily practice, but there are sometimes some temptation to use blood tests or even saliva tests to make the diagnosis of food allergy because it may deliver a quantitative you know, figures on a paper. And it, it may be easier to explain to owners. But is it really reliable? And that was the goal of this uh, fourth C18. Can we really diagnose adverse food reaction with tests? And uh, it was Professor Muller who made uh, this uh, paper um, and he checked all, all uh, uh, relevant information on intradermal tests, uh, IgE testing in blood tests, uh, lymphocyte proliferation assays, or even patch testing. And you can see in which space there were, there were some papers. They also uh, checked uh, documentation or more invasive tests that were done more in a research mode, I would say, like gastro gastroscopic testing or colonoscopic testing. So some tried to see if uh, that was uh, relevant. And uh, there are also now some, uh, some uh, kind of uh, promotion around hair testing or saliva rate testing. And um, many information uh, around all this uh, question. And basically, you will see all the results go the same way now, is that uh, those tests are not, to date, reliable enough. Here, you can see in a poster that was shared in a European Dermatology Congress uh, just a few years ago. And they try to see the results in saliva and in blood from healthy pets and from real food allergic animals diagnosed with the right process. And in uh, some of the cases, you could see no difference. It was not able to discriminate between healthy animals or food allergic animals. And here is a sum up of all those uh, studies. Intradermal test, serum IgE test, serum IgG test. It's clinically not relevant because you can see too much variation and not enough uh, positive predict predictability. So, Positive predictability, basically it's the number of true positive out of the number of all positive. Meaning if you have 35% positive predictability in only one case out of three, it will be a real positive. So it's not something you can use for real diagnosis. Then for lymphocyte proliferation tests, uh, the results are good. Uh, it's just that this so far, it's not available uh, for daily practice. It's very complex to manage. You have to make analysis just hours after the sampling, and it's, it's complex and not really available. And patch testing, only the negative results are, are, are good. The positive predictability is not good enough, uh, so it's not something you would do in, in daily practice. And in CAT, basically, it goes the same way. Uh, this last uh, one on, on, on diagnostic, because it's, it's a good illustration, there were even some uh, dermatology uh, specialists who wanted to try uh, the reliability of some tests and they sent many samples to some, um, to some suppliers of uh, hair tests and saliva tests. And they really uh, put it, uh, made this study so far that they sent samples from healthy animals, samples from uh, allergic animals, and also some samples from synthetic fur uh, animals and also sterile saline sample, just as like uh, uh, negative uh, controls. And rather strangely, you have here some of the results. 
uh, in the chart, you can see some animals so with um, food allergy, some with environmental allergy, and some, uh, well, fake, uh, fake uh, samples from uh, synthetic fur animals, and there was no statistical difference. So really, uh, just all this shows that there, are, there is much marketing around this, to be honest, but so far the science doesn't confirm the reliability of all those tests. And this will lead us to our, our free uh, further question around the diagnostic. Dr. Vishal. Thank you, Isa. So guys, again, uh, interesting question for you. This is again regarding the diagnostic of uh, adverse food reaction and what are the particularly ways of it. So what is the gold standard method up to date for the diagnosis of adverse food reaction in case of dogs and cats. And your options are blood test for Ig majors, saliva test, reliable and easier to perform, or is it food elimination trial for cats and dogs? I'm repeating the question. What is the gold standard method to date for the diagnostic of adverse food reaction in case of dogs and cats? And your options are blood test for IgE majors, saliva test, reliable and easier to perform, and food elimination trial. So whichever you feel the right answer, please enter it. We will wait for a few more seconds, Isa. Okay, we are good to go. Thank you. Okay, so... Uh... Yeah, thanks to what we just discussed. I think we, we all agree that tests may be promising, but not to date uh, reliable enough. So the gold standard diagnosis for adverse food reaction is really to perform an elimination trial. And so it's, it's really important that we are all agree on this and are able to explain to the pet owners that it's the way to do it to be sure, actually. And uh, yes, we will have a related question about the duration, because now we know we have to do it, but for how long? So Dr. Vishal, please. Okay, thank you, Isa. Can we have uh, our another uh, next uh, poll question on screen, guys? Okay, so the question is, what is the optimal duration for the elimination phase of food trials in dogs? So your options are, is it four weeks? Is it six to eight weeks? Or is it 12 to 15 weeks? These are really, this is really good question because uh, many vets uh, might have uh, queries regarding how long the elimination phase or particularly elimination trial of food can be done or conducted on the dogs. So, and you're, uh, you, you have a few more seconds to enter your answers or your response. Really good to see Isa, all these questions are very practical and uh, these are quite commonly asked by the veterinarians. Okay, good. Yeah, so good to go Isa, over to you. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, so it, it's, we often have the question because some pet owners may be afraid or don't want to, to go through this. They say, wow, I, I may have to feed a, a new diet for a few months my dog won't like it, I don't want to change, isn't, isn't there another way to do it? And no, we have to do it, but perhaps it won't take as long as they may fear. So for this, uh, there was also a critically appraised topic, and they checked to see uh, till how long you need to have this elimination phase. Because I remember when I was in vet school, I was told about uh, three months would be necessary, but there were no real... Uh, uh, no real data to substantiate. It was like an estimation in three months should be okay. And um, even after when in the field, that's what we had in mind. But they checked now really what's uh, the data behind. And what is good is that they could see you don't need to go till 12 weeks. 12 weeks is not necessary. You can have already 90% uh, reliability, 90% response in eight weeks in dogs and in cats. So eight weeks is really great. It's enough. You don't need to extend. And if it's difficult to motivate owners to go to eight, you can go till five in dogs or six in cats and you will have 80% response. But 
our recommendation would be to try to go to, to eight because really with eight, you're, you're nearly sure it's going to be uh, perfectly uh, managed. And regarding uh, how to do it with, with food, uh, we will present you a few insights on uh, some trials that were made with some uh, dermatology specialists to check if uh, an allergenic, so a product we have um, with extensively hydrolyzed protein source, if it's okay to make this diagnosis for, for dogs and cats. So here you have a study that was led by Dr. Marie-Christine Cadierga, who is a French dermatologist, and she was my teacher at vet school. Um, and she was leading a study with other vet clinics in France to assess this diagnostic value of an allergenic comparing to what was the gold standard at the time, uh, a home cooked diet. And they really compare in, in a nice study design rigorous um, in 72 dogs. And so uh, dogs with this suspicion of food allergy were enrolled in the study. And uh, they had to go through this elimination phase of eight weeks, then a re-challenge. And it's really key uh, to insist on the importance of this re-challenge phase. Really, uh, if you don't do both phases you cannot conclude because you may have pets really improving during the eight weeks, but not being food allergy. They may improve just because the diet is really great and better than their previous diet. And this diet is formulated to support skin barrier, to decrease skin inflammation. So the dog may improve, but then if you do the re-challenge and there is no flare, it's not food allergy. So you really have to do both elimination phase and re-challenge. Just a few days usually is enough to see the signs. And with this study uh, about diagnostic, the, 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 the results were really the same with the homemade diet and with or, or an allergenic food. So uh, it's really uh, confirmed to be as reliable as uh, adequate homemade diet to make the diagnosis of food allergy in dogs. Another point that was interesting, uh, of course, reliability and efficacy is the first criteria, but sometimes we were asked questions about also the cost, uh, and it's important, even though it's for just eight weeks. And so um, this team of investigators also had to collect precise information on the cost, the cost for the one who made homemade diet, and the cost precisely for the one who went on an allergenic. So with bills, uh, from, uh, from the uh, clinic uh, practice or from uh, the store where they bought uh, homemade uh, food. And here is a comparison that was made. And as you can see, actually, an allergenic was less expensive than the homemade diet uh, for this, um, in this study. So uh, efficacy is the first criteria indeed, but it's also good to comfort people that it may not be uh, more expensive than homemade diet, actually. So it's kind of easy because it's just full food. You don't have to perform invasive tests. It's really reliable and it's uh, less expensive than home diet. And uh, we, we may wonder about cats. So we have launched uh, the cat uh, version of an allergenic um, in 2016, well, later than the dog one because we needed some uh, research also and development phases. And we could present last year in the World Congress of Dermatology the results for the same kind of trial, really, we wanted to confirm it was okay to make the diagnostic of food allergy also in cats. And it was uh, complex to do because uh, uh, cats can go out, can escape. Uh, it's less easy to, to get full compliance, but um, there were uh, some nice cases. And this involved actually a dermatology specialist and experts from several European countries whose name you have here. So it was multicentric. Germany, Sweden, Belgium, and French uh, dermatologists. And so these adult cats with suspected IFR were switched to an allergenic for eight weeks to cater to the criteria we said, then re-challenge and restabilization afterwards. And uh, yes, score fat, so the, the lesions were measures, the proitors also, and uh, pet owners also had to provide some information on acceptance, tolerance, and so on. And uh, Dr. Kerstin Bergval is a diplomate from a European College of Vet Dermatology, and she's working in Sweden, and she was the lead investigator on this uh, trial. And uh, she had uh, um, uh, one case um, with this cat, Legolas, who had been scratching for one year and a half. And this cat, when included, was just moderately managed 
with a classical food uh, for food allergic animal, but he had to take uh, prednisolone once in a while to help stabilize uh, the scratching and, and the inflammation. So he was switched to an allergenic for eight weeks, then re challenge. And during the elimination phase on the new food, the signs really improved and he could even stop steroids after one week. During the re-challenge, signs went back. So there were facial lesions again. And then it was uh, okay again when switched back to an allergen. So this is just one of the cases from this study. Uh, all results went the same way. Improvement of lesion and scratching on the new food, flare when re-challenge, and then improvement again. And so um, in, the, in this case uh, where it's improved and then you are decreased uh, on re-challenge, it was really uh, food allergic cases. And so um, this study just confirmed also it's okay in cats for the diagnostic. And regarding how long, there is a new study uh, we wanted to, to share uh, because uh, eight weeks is, is okay, but even sometimes in some cases, some owners don't want to do it. Uh, or we as vets sometimes are reluctant to insist. And we know compliance is really key for food allergy, and, but it can be difficult. And this is a paper uh, of what they call health belief model. They wanted to investigate which factors are associated with real owner adherence and compliance to the elimination trial in dogs. And among the criteria they really assessed uh, with rigor were their perceived barriers, own barriers that owners had uh, about their own lifestyle, and they thought it may uh, impair the trial, or they thought it was impossible to stop their dog from uh, going eating trash or even litter or going outside. They thought that there would be also self-efficacy question. I feel comfortable calling my vet if I have problems, I feel confident I can follow the diet strictly. I have the ability to change my habits to make it work. All this was evaluated. And it's nice to see, well, to, well it's just confirmation that those perceived barriers have an influence. And it's improved when there is better communication, when they understand they can do it. It's not that complicated. Uh, and they have the tool to explain to their family also why to do it. So communication is really key for compliance. And one of the question of what was about um, alternatives to try to decrease even more this duration. And there was a recent study that tried to, to check this. It was presented in a, in a Congress and then published in Vet Dermatology Journal. And they checked if we can shorter this phase by using an allergenic food and a short course of low dose steroids. And so, uh, uh, they included more than 50 dogs, and uh, they could uh, really investigate this question. On these cases, uh, they could see that after four weeks, with the doses of steroids that was allowed, actually it was okay. Um, there was really a, a flare after provocation, and they were without symptoms in four weeks. So the diagnostic could really be made. Uh, and so the conclusion of this study was that duration of elimination phase can be shortened to four weeks instead of eight if you use an allergenic and steroids. What is really important just to keep in mind is that it's a first study. There may be other ones in the future. They could not uh, evaluate with other drugs. And the mode of action may be different, so we cannot extrapolate. So far, it's shown with this diet and with this drug because not all drugs work the same way. And we don't know for with a, a cyclosporine or oclacitinib, for example, if this, this may be the same. And they all insist that this procedure is, is really need a close contact with the owner to be sure to really monitor the signs very well. And then we will have our fifth question, uh, Dr. Vishal. Yeah, thank you, Isa. So guys, the fifth question, can we have a fifth question for everyone? The question is very most, the most common queries usually asked by the pet owners and the vets is what are the most frequent ingredients involved in food allergies in case of pets? And the options are, first is beef, lamb, tuna, and rice, chicken, turkey, corn, and pork, or C, beef, chicken, dairy products, and fish. 
you just need to select any one option which you feel the right answer for this particular query and thank you isabel again because these are the very common questions which uh, this is again one of the common question which most of the vets and even pet parents they ask to us and uh, certain myths certain uh, certain uh, queries they have regarding a uh, various other uh, veg vegetable origin sources okay. particularly gluten and all if you can okay. just throw some lights on it it will be really helpful for us uh, over to isabel uh, we are good to go isabel okay thanks uh, okay I happy to see it's a, it's a relevant question for your daily practice uh, in, in india yes uh, it's it's a tricky question. So we wanted this uh, free dermatologist to dig into this and to provide us with real evidence. And this was uh, one of the critically appraised topic uh, to really determine the most common food allergens. And so this is uh, the top three uh, podium for for dogs. And actually, this is the answer for dogs. So the first one it was beef, uh, 33 40, 34 percent. Sorry, then dairy products and chicken. In cat, beef was also in the first position, but you see it's less frequent than fish and then chicken, just 5%. Those are really the top three. Uh, then the other ones are, are, are quite more rare. And um, it, it's just important to have in mind if we want to make um, a rich challenge, usually we recommend to do with the previous food, like is fed one food, you switch to an allergenic eight weeks, it's fine. And then you make a rich challenge, you put back on the previous food, and then you know it's fine, it's food allergy, it's diagnosed, then you can manage. Sometimes uh, pet owners want to know the real uh, protein causing the allergy because they want to, uh, to, to be able to give uh, tidbits or feed foods from the table sometimes, I don't know. But there are cases where they want to know the real ingredient, not the food is allergic to. That's why we recommend, uh, well, one of the first check to reach challenge could be beef because it's really the most frequently involved. Uh, then you can uh, make alternative uh, reach challenges, but it's, it's quite time consuming. But so most in most cases, dermatologists recommend to make elimination phase, then reach challenge with the previous food and then uh, management. And regarding, yes, vegetable origin, it, it's a good question. So far, there, there are not... Um, you cannot say that uh, there are no allergy to, to uh, vegetal origin protein, but as you can see, it's, they are not in the top three. It's, it's uh, really less frequent. For example, corn, it's just 4% of dogs that are allergic to corn. So wheat, corn are really less involved uh, in frequency. But as regards gluten, this is another question. Uh, of course, it's very important and it has quite some impact in human medicine and it's proven. In dogs, it's different. Uh, you don't have uh, this exact same uh, pathology uh, with gluten sensitivity. It has been demonstrated in um, one colony of uh, setters where there was actually this uh, gluten sensitivity uh, with severe consequences, but it's not something that is uh, similar to what's happening in human, um, in human medicine at all. So the, the question of gluten allergy is really for human, but not really for, for dogs. For dogs and cats, it's really here the key ingredients. And regarding then, which food can I give? Uh, now that I'm sure I have made my diagnosis with the right duration, which food to use? And here we wanted to give a, a few information about uh, why is an allergenic efficient and why those uh, vets endorse uh, uh, such range is because there are many proofs and it's proven uh, as diagnostic efficacy, but also it's been proven that it's really hydrolyzed a lot, and that's what makes a difference. It's what we call extensive hydrolyzation. It's not partial, it's really extensive. You go till, to such an extent that it's nearly only amino acid or, or oligopeptide, and this was proven through several trials. This is one of the in vitro studies that's really investigated, where they checked uh, to make a comparison with a classical poultry meal, and just uh, partially hydrolyzed, and you see a real difference. Uh, you have blood recognition for a classical uh, poultry meal, but not for this feather extensively hydrolyzed pro uh, protein. It was the same for cats, the same uh, proof confirmed uh, absence of immune recognition. And this was done also uh, through uh, uh, gel electrophoresis. So it's just one of the examples of those gels. 
where you have uh, MW stands for molecular weight, and you have a scale on the left. So it's expressed in Dalton and kilodalton, sorry, which is the size of the protein. And we know that if you have a protein uh, a certain size, they will be recognized by the immune system if you're allergic. Whereas if it's hydrolyzed really a lot, there is no binding to a G, no immune recognition, and it doesn't trigger allergy. And here you can see the difference in protein content. You put the protein in the, in the gel, uh, in the wells above, and then it migrates depending on their side. And you see the non-hydrolyzed chicken meal and HCM mini bonds, so many protein and some with big size. And with the extensively hydrolyzed uh, poultry feather, so it's or, or a protein source, you don't see any band because you are hydrolyzed even much more than what you have here. Uh, they also uh, investigated cornstarch, which is our purified source of starch that we made on purpose instead of having classical cereal. And you also uh, make a difference in uh, immunogenicity as compared to classical corn flour. So really, real differences between poultry meal or uh, and with really uh, extensively hydrolyzed protein. And now uh, that diagnostic is made, uh, what to use as a management on the long term. You may still want to use an allergenic, but uh, to be honest, it's not necessary. It's great to have it for the diagnosis because of its purity, quality, extensively hydrolyzed protein. But for the long term, uh, some ranges have already shown their efficacy. And uh, here is just an example with the hypoallergenic small dog. We could really show it works very well. So in most cases, really, uh, hypoallergenic should be enough for the management during months and years in dogs and in cats. This was with another trial, same things. And uh, yeah, just a point about the real chicken allergic pets. Uh, we want to, to investigate. So there are some cases, perhaps you have some cases uh, with a real diagnosis of allergy to chicken. And um, with Petra Bezikova, who works in North Carolina in US and uh, Professor Olivier, they made a trial to, to check if it was okay uh, with our product. And they compared to another product from uh, the market uh, with uh, hydrolyzed poultry protein. And there was a difference uh, in those 10 dogs. Uh, the dogs fed uh, an allergenic, well, it's called Ultamino in the US. You had no clinical signs in those chicken allergic dogs. It was okay. And with the other products, with a hydrolyzed poultry source, you have uh, some, uh, some signs, uh, some flares in 40% cases. And stool also were different. So it's also an important point to have uh, nice tools in those animals because of their digestive uh, potential issues. So they just mentioned uh, that because of this study and all the other ones, the diet is a valuable diagnostic tool and also for treatment if we want. And the last point I wanted to address is about sometimes some fears uh, or mis, uh, missing trust in industrial pet food. So depending on the country, on the people. And here we wanted to uh, have figures to, uh, to explain uh, about are there cross-contamination in the, those pet food. And so they checked uh, many uh, studies that investigated uh, some pet foods and compare analyses to what was written on the labeling. And uh, interestingly here, so you can have a look at the CAT online later on, but here the, the red column shows a percentage of dates, diets in the papers where they found some ingredients present that were not mentioned on the label. So you see it happen in quite many cases. And in some cases, in blue, it was the other way around. There were things mentioned on the label that were not found when making the analysis. That is uh, less frequent. And then in a few cases where you have this small square, there were papers where those were diets recommended for food allergy. So this is not normal. That should not happen. And interestingly, the number one on the left is a study we have made and published on uh, an allergenic products, dogs and cats. And there is no issue, meaning there are no missing ingredients and no uh, contaminating ingredients. And we have proven it. Uh, and it's really because we have a, a very uh, demanding process of cleaning and checking with DNA tests on the finished product. And this was really something we have uh, since the very beginning. 
we even improve our cleaning procedure. And uh, uh, that's what we call Mr. Clean here. And that's why we don't have this uh, cross-contaminating protein. This was published, shown in a Congress. And uh, this is a paper. It's also open access. You can see the full detail. And this really shows all the results we have. And this is our uh, management system. We have to make DNA tests, but specific ones because of an allergenic complexity. If the DNA is above a specific threshold, then we make some PCR to find which species may be contaminating. And it's what we call NPPI, uh, non-protein pollution index. And if NPPI is above a threshold, the product is immediately discarded. We don't put it on the field before we have those results. Everything else is fine, it's fine, and we release the product. And that was another of the, of the results we presented in, in, in the paper. So just confirming the extensive hydrolysis and uh, our purities. And just to, to, to summarize this question, it was uh, uh, shown in, in a nice paper from um, uh, Dr. Ritchie, where they say, if something is wrong and we don't understand why, well, there are no improvement of the science during the elimination phase, what may be the cause? So they can be caused linked to owner or to the disease, but they can be caused linked to the food itself, like it's contaminated, or they are remaining uh, fragments because it's not hydrolyzed enough, or it's not the right choice of protein. And really with an allergenic uh, uh, philosophy, the idea was really to address this all. It's really uh, not cross-contaminated, very pure, proven, extensively hydrolyzed. And just a question I was making is sometimes we talk about hydrolyzed diet and it just, uh, it's not misleading, but I want it to be, to be uh, clear here. Even sometimes some specialists call it hydrolyzed diet. And then they ask, but is everything hydrolyzed? Is it the whole formula? And it's a protein that is hydrolyzed. So it's um, just to make things clear uh, and it's not uh, misleading. It's really the protein that must be hydrolyzed not to trigger allergenicity. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I will conclude with really the take home messages from this. And I hope it was clear and uh, uh, useful insights. Food allergy are not that rare. Scratching is really a key symptom, but there can be other ones. Quality of life is decreased. Uh, and uh, the top three allergic ingredients were beef, dairy products, and chicken in dog, and beef, fish, and chicken in cats. Allergy to grains and cereals are really rare. Uh, and diagnosis really is based upon food. So no blood tests, no saliva tests, really elimination trial for around eight weeks, four weeks in specific condition, but otherwise eight weeks, re-challenge, having a food that is really uh, not contaminated, that is hydrolyzed enough or with the right protein source and really compliance and communication are really key. And then we will have our last question. Uh, please, Dr. Bisham. Thank you, Isabel. So last question of the day, guys. And this question is based on our allergenic product. So allergenic range relies on several key features to ensure reliability in the diagnostic of adverse food reaction and the management of the complex cases. And your options are uh, the soya extensively hydrolyzed protein source is sufficient so need to have factory line cleaning or checks nor clinical trials. The second option is partially hydrolyzed protein source from feeder origin and purified cornstarch. Third option is extensively hydrolyzed protein source, purified cornstarch, in-depth cleaning in factories, plus to ensure DNA analysis and absence of cross-contaminations and multiple studies. So what do you feel the most appro uh, the appropriate answer of this particular question? It's really fantastic, Isabel, because uh, this allergenic ranges and uh, uh, particularly how we are manufacturing and why it is important to take uh, certain precautionary measures to avoid cross-contamination. And uh, uh, really, really, uh, I appreciate that you shared these things with our, our vet stakeholders. Over to Isabel. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Uh, to, uh, to be honest, when I, the first time I went in one of the factory which producing it, I was amazed because it was the first time I saw with my own eyes. I was told about the cleaning, 
But when I could see, they stop everything just to clean. It's so much depth and check everything. With, it's it's really great. <laughs> so yes, really the key points were about efficacy, safety, um, uh, good digestive tolerance. It's even been shown in in some uh, IBD cases that it was working. Uh, reliability, we discuss it, uh, with really extensively hydrolyzed protein source. That's why it's so special. Uh, proven absence of ancillary protein. And that's why uh, you find the sum up on our bags with oligopeptide and allergen restriction. It's really what uh, Dr. Vishal mentioned about really in-depth cleaning and check with DNA. Uh, uh, that's what uh, makes it so unique and with uh, proven efficacy. So thanks really a lot for your attention. It was really a pleasure. And uh, if we have, uh, I don't know, a few minutes for a few questions, uh, with a uh, pleasure.